from Mickey, Aurora, <laughs> and from me. Well, Mickey has fled. Oh, <laughs> Mickey's so well trained, she knows to go there. And also, <laughs> Mickey doesn't want to jockey for position with Aurora. <laughs> so, now, before anything else, if Aurora will allow me to do so, I would like to bring to your attention that in Britain, October is Black History Month. And in all the time Megan was here, notwithstanding the fact that she's 43% Nigerian, she never acknowledged Black History Month. Well, I am reading a very good book at the moment which I will hold up for you and we will post what it is in a clip immediately after this. The autobiography of Mary Seacole, who was a lady of colour who, along with Florence Nightingale, not that they did it jointly, because they did it separately, were heroines in the Crimean War. So she was Jamaican. She was what she describes as herself as a Creole, which actually is not accurate. Josephine was a Creole. Josephine Bonaparte, she was a Creole. The Empress Josephine. Creoles were actually white. Mary Seacole was a woman of color. She calls herself in the book yellow, <laughs> which is obviously a 19th century description. Uh, and there are some historians who think she was a quadroon. Well, her father was white and her mother was a woman of colour, not black, because in those days, if you were fully black, you were called a Negro, and she was, according to Mary Seacole, a Creole. And one historian thinks she was, that Mary was what they categorised as a quadroon. I don't believe that. She wasn't three-quarter white. She might have been, oh, uh, would it be three-eighths black and five-eighths white, but she definitely was not three-quarters white. You only need to look at her to tell. So that will be posted and also I'm going to ask them to post because four years ago this month, I launched, <laughs> Aurora has the word launch, and she's launching into giving me kisses. So I'm going to just ignore her and continue. Four years ago, at to celebrate Black History Month at the Black History Museum in Brixton, I had the honour of having this book launched by the Deputy High Commissioner of Jamaica and the head of the Black History Museum, Dawn Hill, who is an old friend of mine. She's Jamaican. And it's People of Colour and the Royals, and it covers what I found surprising, the lack of colour prejudice as opposed to class prejudice that existed amongst the elite at a time that we would have thought there was colour prejudice. There was, at least not in the United Kingdom and not in Europe, there was a surprising degree of, oh, we, well, we would think it's surprising because of what we've been told, uh, lack of colour prejudice. Not to say there wasn't any at all. There's always prejudice. But 
it was a fascinating book to write and a fascinating book because of the ground it covers and its importance, especially as a result of all the mischievousness that Harry and Meghan have got up to since this book was launched. And to show you uh, the, I suppose, the gravity of the subject, I am going to ask that they post a clipping alongside the Mary Seacole dust jacket of the Deputy High Commissioner's speech at the Jamaican High Commission launching this book. Now, if you want to skip over it, please feel free. <laughs> okay, I think it's about four minutes long. And without further ado, afterwards, I will plunge right into the nitty gritty. Okay? Deputy High Commissioner, and it's my absolute pleasure to warmly welcome you here to the High Commission. And you can already feel the Jamaican spirit. <laughs> I'm sure it's much warmer in here than it is outside. And you know, it's, it's, it's great that you're able to join us uh, this evening. I bring you warm greetings from our High Commission Ex Excellency. Seth George Ramakan, who is currently in Jamaica enjoying better weather. <laughs> and I want to say how much of a pleasure and an honor it is for me to have been asked to introduce Lady Campbell. I had the, the pleasure yesterday of introducing her at the press, press launch of the book, and um, it's a pleasure to do it again today. As you know, Lady Campbell is launching her latest book, People of Color and the Royals, and um, I just want to say once again, heartiest congratulations on the latest publication, which is a most fitting tribute to your proud and rich heritage and the fact that you have such long-standing relations with the royals in Europe <laughs> and all over, you know. As you know, Lady Campbell is a prolific writer, socialite, radio and television personality. She was born in Jamaica, I'm told, in 1949, but I find it very difficult to believe. <laughs> I know you find it very difficult to believe as well. Lady Campbell, um, her name actually, Georgie, Georgia Ariana Zaney, but she's affectionately called, I learned, Georgia, by those very close to her, and Lady C by the media world. She's a true reflection of Jamaica's motto, out of many one people, being a product of one of Jamaica's most well-known and prominent families. Despite her own prominence and her popularity and social standing, she has always proudly embraced her Jamaican culture and heritage, and we're so happy for that. And she has shared many proverbs and experiences from her Jamaican experience. Lady Campbell's lack of prejudice has enabled her to examine and sometimes some very difficult you know, past with great objectivity and to underscore the vital role that Jamaica has played over the years in addressing sensitive issues such as discrimination and racism. Lady Campbell, as you know, is a well-known and actually a lot than a New York Times best-selling author. She is also well connected to the royal families of Europe and has had long-standing friendship with, friendships with, with some of them. She has already published various books on the British royal family and has written two autobiographies, including one on her relationship with her mother. Lady Campbell is also a well-known public figure and television personality. You just need to type in, in YouTube or so, Google, you know, and it's there. And it's not surprising that among her many accomplishments was her, um, the, her acclaimed role on the um, I Am A Celebrity Get Me Out Of Here program, which resulted in her being the most Googled personality in 2015. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Campbell's unique heritage, her vast experience, her courage, her warm personality, her insight, and of course her royal connections, together with her resilient, strong character and personality, 
all come beautifully together in our latest book, People of Color and the Royals. And you know, we thought it would be very nice to have the, the cover of the book displayed, of course. I, I don't know, um, it's obvious that one is more beautiful than the other, <laughs> but it, it's very nice, a very nice picture there. And it's very, the book is a reservoir of information and will serve to promote understanding on issues such as race and color while inspiring hope for a united, cohesive future. I had the opportunity of reading some sections of the book, and I also had the privilege yesterday at the press launch of hearing more about the book, and I also benefited tremendously from her knowledge on all things royal and more. The book certainly makes excellent reading, and like you, I look forward to having and hearing more about the book today, and um, look forward to sharing time and space with Lady Campbell. Ladies and gentlemen, it's such a pleasure to have Lady Campbell. And well, to those of you who saw that, I hope you found it interesting. And to those of you who skipped over it, let's plunge right in with a correction from Jean Verso, who says, and she's one of several people who said something along these lines. So I throw my hands up and say, mm, mea culpa. Dear Lady C, I was shocked to hear that someone had written to you claiming that Australia has a referendum to become a republic. What referendum to become a republic? We here in Australia have a referendum on the 14th of October to vote yes or no to change to our, a change to our constitution, constitution, sorry, to add an indigenous voice to parliament. Would you mind taking a moment to address this? There is currently no talk of or push for or any real interest in Australia becoming a republic. Jean Verso and everybody else who mentioned it, I am delighted to do so. Uh, I'm sorry that the questioner uh, provided inaccurate information, but thanks for correcting it. And now, without further ado, we get into the really nitty nitty gritty, nitty nitty sort of stuff, if you don't mind. Elizabeth Besco says, so early next week, the Sussexes will be in New York City for a mental health event. Who will pay for security and travel? Mickey, I beg of you. Quick, go get me some coke. My throat is parched. If the Port Authority pays, if New York City Police pays, it is a blight on citizens' resources. Third time the Sussexes are marching off the New York people in the USA doing it's wrong. If William had a final say, would he welcome the Sussexes back to the UK with open arms? Well, two completely different questions. So <laughs> I'll deal with the first one first, if I may. No, in fact, I'm going to deal with the second one first, and then I'm going to read out subsidiary questions which relate to all of this. Uh, my understanding is that William never wants to see or speak to his brother ever again. My understanding is that he regards his conduct as unacceptable, unfair, treacherous, and disloyal, and unforgivable. Could I be wrong? Well, the people who told me could be wrong even though these are people who know William well, they could be wrong. Oh, goodness gracious. Oh, and pigs could fly. Now, as for the second part of the question, I'm going to read out what Beth says. 
Harry and Meghan are going to New York City to have a summit for parents and children on dealing with online media, October the 10th. People in New York City are calling 311 complaining they don't want their taxpayer dollars spent on their security. And Kate French says, and then I will answer the whole shebang in one. Dear Lady C, I hope that you will pass this on to your viewers. The sharkles are <laughs> sharkles. <laughs> well, I've got great barracuda teeth, don't I? Great orthodontia. <laughs> the sharkles are heading back to New York City for the Conference on Mental Health next week. There is a movement asking for people in New York City to call the mayor of New York City and the governor of New York to lodge a protest to those two being given taxpayer funding security. They are not dignitaries. They are not representing any country. They are not representing visiting on a royal visit. So they are not entitled to tax funded security. I hope that you will ask any of your viewers living in New York City to call and lodge a protest as well. Thank you so much. Well, Kate French, you've asked. I don't think I need to regild that, Lily. Uh, I think this is a matter for each and every resident of, the, of New York to address as he or she sees fit. And, you know, there are really very interesting aspects to this visit. And rather, one could say almost disturbing aspects to this visit, which, because they're in town for world mental health day and i'm going to read out what the archiwell or archiwell however they pronounce it because it should be archiwell not archiwell but anyway however they pronounce it the families have been engaged with the archiwell foundation for the past year bolstering community and driving towards solutions. Together, this is Meghan and Harry's people's announcement. Together, they are united in their mission to share personal experiences, data and research to ensure the same does not happen to other families. Well, I could be awfully dumb I mean, my IQ is only 154. So clearly, I am mentally challenged when you compare me to the splendiferousness of Meghan, who, notwithstanding the fact that she failed her State Department test, is obviously far brighter than I am. And Harry, of course, is even brighter than either of us. He's a man. Anyway. Mental health issues <laughs> uh, arise as a result of certain situations that are usually not avoidable until they have happened. Now, you could say, warn people not to smoke, then they most likely won't develop cancer or uh, smoking related lung cancer. But that's not how smokers work. And that's not really how mental health works. But anyway, they're going to be joined by the US Surgeon General Vivek Murthy to discuss mental health in a panel hosted by Carson Daly. Now, is this the couple that <laughs> Aurora, please, honey, wake up. Oh, mummy feeds a head cold coming on. She needs a solution. Go get me some Coke. If I drink it, 
that will stop me getting a cold. Oh, uh, if I recall correctly, Harry, in his book Spare, went to some considerable lengths to inform all of us, not only about the state of his and his brother's manhood, but also the amount of drugs that he has taken. Now, I am an old hand at Al-Anon, which is one of the original two 12-step programs, the other one being AA. And I seem to recall, and it hasn't changed since when I was going there, that no, if you are taking drugs to self-medicate or link yourself up windshield wipers, wiping away the fog, as Harry put it, oh, you are actually contributing to your lack of mental health, not to your mental health, because mental health doesn't mean mental illness. Mental health is the opposite of mental illness. And these people are misusing the term mental health instead of speaking about the preservation of mental health and the prevention or cure of mental illness. They just lump it all together as mental health. Well, you don't need any direction to be mentally healthy and to retain your mental health, your good mental health. So there's that aspect because right there, Harry's drug taking disqualifies him from actually speaking on the subject whatsoever. Megan's inconsistent claims with regard to her mental health also must disqualify her from having any justification for speaking on the subject. Last October, on one of the Archetypes podcasts, you know, the one that got cancelled by Spotify because it wasn't good enough, uh, and we won't even go into what the chap at Spotify said about them. I will not stoop to that level. She was discussing her own experience about getting referred to see a professional when she was at her worst point. Well, she has already claimed that her worst point was on the 16th of January 2019. I'm so specific because she actually specified the date and time. According to her, she was curled up like a ball with misery because of the terrible things that were being said about her. When, in fact, the evidence is that she was at Mayhew in the day and the Royal Albert Hall at night, beaming delightedly and functioning healthily. So, if, if she has got her timeline mixed up and what she said was true, if it was so important, why would she have got her timeline mixed up? It seems to me that she is being 
she is indulging in a misinformation and a disinformation because she is contradicting herself. But what she said was, I think at my worst point, being finally connected to someone that, you know, my husband had found a referral for me to call and I called this woman. She didn't know I was even calling her and she was checking out at the grocery store. I could hear the little beep beep and I was like, hi, and I'm introducing myself. I suppose she said, hello, I'm Megan the Duchess of Sussex. Or maybe her royal hand is Megan the Duchess of Sussex. And that you can literally, you're going, wait, sorry, I'm just, who is this? Mm. and saying, I need help. And she could have the dire state that I was in. But I think it's for all of us to be really honest about what it is that you need and to not be afraid to make peace with that, to ask for it. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing, but that statement does not accord. In fact, it directly contradicts her previous statement that she went, that she could get no help from Harry and she went to Buckingham Palace and the HR department and got no help from them either. Oh dear, oh dear. Misinformation. Hmm. You know, earlier this year, Murti, or Murphy, however he pronounces his name, said social media presents a profound risk of harm for children and called for immediate action to protect kids now. The Surgeon General said in an urgent health advisory published in May, that the country is experiencing a national youth mental health crisis. Well, this is all very good and well to press people's buttons and terrorize them because I don't seem to understand why all of a sudden everything has to be terrorized and everybody is in terror about everything because oh, I'm so afraid, I'm so afraid, I'm so afraid. The evidence does not show that the children anywhere in the world are at risk of youth mental health crises. What it shows is that there has been a breakdown in discipline. Now, this started long before there was an internet, long before there was social media. It started in the 1950s with Dr. Spock. Now, I'm old enough to remember that prior to my generation, and even in my generation, children were brought up to be prepared for life and not to be protected against the vicissitudes and the annoyances and the aggravations that would inevitably come once they were grown up, but they were prepared for them from childhood. This is something that had been done from biblical times and most likely before until the 1950s when Dr. Spock shifted the focus and the world, the Western world, I should say, became far more child-centered with the result that there was a lessening of discipline and a lessening of the painful consequences of bad behavior, which of course 
some people would say would encourage further bad behavior. It starts with Dr. Spock in the 1950s, when even television was not quite as rampant as it became in the 60s onwards. So social media, no, it didn't exist. Then I'm now going to shift to 1999, the cusp of social media. Columbine. I'm sure we all remember that dreaded word, Columbine. This was really before the internet had the influence, before social media had the influence. It now has. So the link between social media and the violence that has taken place amongst young people cannot be established with social media. It is established with breakdown of discipline from before. We can trace it back to Dr. Spock. But Dr. Spock was actually evocative of an era that was celebratory about the prospects of the world because the Second World War had been fought and won. And much of Eastern Europe was behind the Iron Curtain, but the rest of the world was gradually recovering from and prospering as it had never done in the history of humanity before. This is important because we then had increased opportunities, gratis, increased wealth, with the lessening of discipline. But there was still discipline left over. But where did the change start? And it didn't start actually societally with Dr. Spock. It started with the movies in the 20s, primarily then into the 30s, where you had the romance and, and you had the glamorization of wealth, which created an ethos of extreme materialism in a way that had, en masse, on us in a way that had never happened in society before. Of course, things got derailed by the Wall Street crash of 1929. Because then, of course, in the 30s, you had the Depression and you had really pretty ropey times internationally. Then you had the Second World War. But after that comes great liberality. And I'm the generation that furthered this liberality. And I'm proud of what we did because more people are better off nowadays and, and richer and freer with more choice than has ever happened in the history of humanity up to now. Sadly, we are in danger of losing the benefits to illiberalism, neo-Puritanism and loss of civil liberties. Because what has happened in my lifetime is there was a new philosophy, a post-war philosophy, with all its hopefulness and the belief that altering past beliefs would assure a more peaceful and prosperous future. And to an extent, it did. But what it did at the very moment it was elevating material benefits and encouraging materialism. It was decreasing the spiritual 
aspect of life and where the spiritual was becoming of a less importance and being ignored at the expense of the material. So we enter into an aspirational age where covetousness, which is one of the ten, ten commandments, covetousness becomes not a sin, but a virtue. Do you begin to see that everything in life has a price and change can be good, but change also brings within its wake surprising and unexpected and sometimes detrimental effects. We have poo-pooed in my lifetime the benefits of spiritual, the spiritual dimension in the human being and made decency almost akin to stupidity where if you're a clever person in business, you not only seek the maximum benefit but to seek the maximum benefit you have to actually screw the person you are dealing with in business this is morally wrong we cannot as a culture as a civilization as as a people as people as individuals we cannot live without a strong naturalistic time-tested moral code that differentiates between good and bad right and wrong your rights and my rights and find a way when there is conflict for a resolution to take place in a sufficiently constructive way that nobody suffers. So I don't have to agree with you, you don't have to agree with me, and we can both live in harmony. Even if I find your beliefs offensive and you find mine offensive, we should be able to tolerate each other's beliefs and live in harmony. I will use a simple example. There's been for many years now a famous double act on British television, Andrew Pearce and Kevin Maguire. Kevin Maguire is a very left-wing journalist. Andrew Pearce is a centrist verging on the right journalist. And they have been a double act for at least a decade. And they obviously like and respect each other. That is what civility is all about. Well, of course, what has also happened in society today is the erosion of influence within the family as a result of the incursions by the state into family life. And, you know, you find, for instance, doctors deciding to terminate the life of children, as happened here recently in England with a, an ill child, notwithstanding the fact that she and her parents wanted her to be able to continue fighting to the absolute end. They actually prevented the family from taking this child abroad to possibly prolong her life. I'm sorry, that is iniquitous. Schools, 
now have so much power that parents are rendered essentially spare wheels on the vehicle. How is it possible that children can be brought up in a world and end up knowing good from bad, right from wrong, if they are prevented by the state from using their parents as the prime example and the primary teachers. Now, I'm not saying that all parents are perfect. Mine certainly weren't. Nevertheless, I will say, despite all their failings, we got a very sterling education in terms of values, mores, etc. So even people who are as disturbed as my mother was, and my father was really, quite frankly, a pathetic weakling, uh, despite being a much nicer person than her, doesn't alter the fact they equipped the four of their children with good sterling virtues. So parents don't have to be perfect for the children to absorb good lessons. Children will also absorb bad lessons. As indeed they have been doing. Hence why you have, because if, let me put it this way, if the state passes laws that will prevent parents from exerting the influence that they should naturally and which is desirable, when a crisis occurs, the children are going to be sufficiently alienated from the parents to not want to go to them for assistance. Think about it for a moment. Loosening the ties. It's not always a good thing. Well, I think I've said enough on this subject. So I'll wrap it up by saying, I think it's really laughable that Harry and Meghan, both of whom are off their conduct studies in disorder, can be actually seriously being presented as suitable to be chairing, overseeing, hosting, even commenting upon anything to, with regards to mental health, including child mental health. What do they know about child mental health? Nothing. Neither of them, obviously, was a child that grew into a healthy adult mentally and their children are both too young for them to have any experience whatsoever and quite frankly at the rate they're going I would say oh, thank god I had daddy and mummy instead of Harry and Meghan. Mm. Let me put it that way. So I think I've said enough on that subject. So, Susan says something, says, Lady C, have you heard about Press Forward? RQL is one of the groups funding this coalition to take over local US newspapers. I have heard about Press Forward and I have heard about RQL's involvement I think it is extremely remiss of the British government and I think it is extremely remiss of the British crown if this should take place to not divest itself of all links 
between Harry and our monarchy. Because in effect, newspaper owners wield a lot of influence, especially local newspaper owners, because local newspapers, especially in the US, have traditionally been far more accurate where the news was concerned than the larger newspapers. The larger newspapers push agendas that the smaller newspapers don't. The smaller newspapers just usually deal, the local newspapers they're called, usually deal just in fact what happened. Mrs. Mary Smith was crossing the road and had a problem, or uh, the mayor, da da da, and it's just factual reporting. They are, so far they have been known as the only news organs in the newspaper field in the United States of America that approximates to accuracy and to lack of bias where the news is concerned. Because the Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, Chicago, etc., LA Times, blah, 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 they all incline to be influencers, not purveyors of news. Is it acceptable to uh, the American people to have a British prince being able to influence how the American people receive their news? I'll put it another way as well. It raises the question, is that British prince, by virtue of being a foreign prince, an agent of a foreign state? He may not be the agent of a foreign state, but by being a foreigner and functioning in a way that is challenging to the Constitution of the United States of America, his role and his influence approximates that of a malignant foreign agent on U.S. soil. Now that is an issue that the American people should have to contend with themselves. I think it is something that the citizens of America, if it happens, would be well within their rights to raise with their leaders, their congressmen, their congresswomen, their senators, and their president. And if they don't get satisfaction, they should vote them out and start to get independents who will actually not only listen, but implement policies that the people want. Democracy is not just about voting once every few years and thereafter letting the dotes that you have voted for create havoc in your life. Democracy is also about doing your bit to maintain that your elected representatives represent you, not their interests, your interests. I hope that answers the question. David Cooper wants to know, dear Lady C, do you know if Harry had a prenup before he got married to Meghan? No, he didn't. Prenups are not quite as secure in this country as they are in the United States of America. But he was advised to get one and he refused because he and Meghan have a lifelong love and commitment that exceeds anything that Abelard and Eloise, Liz and Dick, Romeo and Juliet, Mutt and Jeff had. 
So, Susan Campbell says, and this is really rather droll, and I have to read it out as a result. To anyone who believes that Meghan Markle will get a million dollars an episode, I've got a beachfront property in Switzerland to sell them. <laughs> Landlocked locked Switzerland. <laughs> well, I suppose Susan Campbell, clever Dicky Birds would say, well, Lake Lausanne would have beach property. So I think we better take as an example Andorra in the Pyrenees which has no lakes and definitely is landlocked. Yeah, I know the most wonderful beach property in Andorra, just down the road from one of the stair lifts to the ski slopes. Fabulous beach property. <laughs> Stefa Shayla says, I don't know if this would fit into the framework of your programme or not, but I would love to see an expose of the talents and accomplishments of King Charles. He is regularly referred to as spineless, and yet his whole adult life he's weathered hurricanes of public disapproval and quietly stood his ground. I'm referring to his environmental and architectural arguments, as well as the storms over his marriage. Few commenters seem to know about his talent as a watercolorist, a musician and an advocate for traditional arts. His accomplishments at Highgrove in creating an organic haven and at Poundbury, which has become a thriving community aren't brought forward as proof of his strengths. Both are highly successful and both withstood a lot of criticism. The King's, the King, sorry, monitors farms and supports farming families on his estates. The King's dignified and measured response to Harry are also signs of strength in the face of disapproval, in my opinion. He does a lot of down-to-earth good that isn't often acknowledged in the chattering media, while false allegations of weakness go unchallenged. Lastly, I'd like to see more respect in the media for the King's erudition. I should hope they'd be proud of having an informed monarch. Hmm. I've read it out because by and large, I agree. I think the king has a many, many virtues. I try to make out wherever possible in the past that he is not the weakling that people seem to think he is. And he has had many challenges in his life and faced adversity with grace and courage. I do think, though, that he needs to be very careful if he continues to support, by omission, his son's incursions in the United States of America into the political consequences of Harry and Meghan's goals and actions. So I will just say that, but otherwise, I agree, I agree. Then a Scot who loves Scotland says, Lady C, what do you make of Time Magazine putting Hamza Youssef on its cover? Do you think it's yet more interference from people who want to weaken our country? <laughs> That's one way of looking at it. No, I think 
they simply wanted to have somebody who was radical, who was ethnic, who was Muslim, who was going to tick all those boxes. Uh, time has become a very left of center publication that is totally unrecognizable from when Henry Luce owned it. Now, my sister-in-law was engaged to Henry Luce. So I know a little bit about Henry Luce as a person as well through her. And he must be spinning like a top in his grave. However, Time and Newsweek and all of those publications are facing severe challenges from the internet. And Time and Newsweek's way forward has been, if you can't beat them, join them. And since the trend seems to be towards in a certain direction, let's beat that drum. But according to Time, Hamza Yusuf, and I mean, they couldn't have chosen a worse time to run this article because, I mean, they have shown how totally out of touch they are with the reality of political life in this country. And Time's raison d'etre was always to have its finger on the political pulse. But what do they do? They put Hamza Youssef on the cover as one of the next generation's leaders to look out for. At, and then they say that he is being hindered by internal divisions and the police probe into the Scottish Nationalist Party's finances and that the party may now be vulnerable, while Yusuf's authority could come under strain if the Social Scottish National Party is seen to lose its electoral edge. Well, they need to make up their minds. Either he's going to be the future's man, or he shouldn't have been on because he's in a sinking ship. Well, What is really interesting is that Yusuf told Time about the importance of his faith as a Muslim and that he is proud to be the first Muslim head of government of a Western nation. However, Tory Scottish National S. Scot <laughs> sorry member of the Scottish Parliament. Craig Hoy said, of course we should celebrate Hamza Yusuf's achievements as Scotland's first Muslim leader. Unfortunately, six months into his term, there's little else to applaud. He's chosen to ignore Scotland's real priorities by continuing to focus on separatist obsessions. He may not have long to enjoy his exposure in Time, the magazine, before the electoral call, electorate called Time on his leadership. Because, of course, well, all of this has been going on. There was a huge row in Parliament because of police numbers on SNP's watch. According to the Scottish Tory leader, Douglas Ross, who registered his interest in the matter, because he's obliged to say if he has an interest and he's married to a policewoman, he said there are now fewer than 700, there are no, sorry, 700 fewer bobbies on the beat than there used to be. Alison Johnston, the Scottish Parliament presiding officer, demanding that the First Minister apologise after he effectively called 
Douglas, Ross and Lyle, which he's not allowed to do. Nor did Anas Sauer, the Scottish Labour leader in Parliament, help Yusuf's cause at all because he said 600 fewer policemen and women were now patrolling Scotland's streets and what's more the SNP were closing police stations left right and center all over the country well while all of this was going on there was actually an election taking place at Rutherglen and Hamilton West and maybe Mr. Yusuf had his mind on that because they lost ignominiously with a 20.4% swing to Labour. So, Time Magazine, very untimely of you to have put him on the cover. And I have to say, as somebody who loves Scotland, who has, through marriage, one of the most eminent names in Scotland, if I may quote my ex-husband, <laughs> and who loves the Scots, I do wish they would give up on trying to destroy their country and ignoring all the benefits that would accrue to the people of the country if they would stop focusing on their political aims and their hoped for gains at the expense of the Scottish people. Because I have to ask myself and would ask them, what is the purpose of independence to go back into the European Union? Well, I know the answer to that. They don't even want to be Dakota to the US's Washington. They would like to be Wichita, Kansas. Hmm. Somehow, I don't think the Cope brothers are coming to their aid. Very misguided. And on that note, I'll say thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been of some interest to you. If it has, Please keep the questions and the comments coming in so I will know what you want us to address. Okay? Thank you. Take care. And please remember to like, share, subscribe, and ring the notification bell if you have truly enjoyed this. Okay? Thank you so much. God bless. Bye-bye.